Hello. I'm happy to talk to you about how the importance of computer architecture affects the rate we're going to improve artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence started in the 1950s, and the dominant way to think about it was a top-down approach. If we just wrote down all the rules, kind of if this happens, do that, and got the rule set right with the proper logic, intelligence would emerge. But within artificial intelligence, there was another group that said that's impossible. The only way we're going to learn that is from the data. We, you have to go bottom up from the data to create those rules. Human beings can't figure that out themselves. And within machine learning, there's another group that said the only way we can do this is supervised learning where we try and imitate the neurons of the brain. And this is called deep neural networks. Deep neural networks have two pieces, training, where um, you're deriving from the data a model. And then once you have that model, you infer it or serve it. You put it to work. So training could take days, but inference could take milliseconds. And this deep neural network piece is what led to the Turing Award to Hinton, Bengio, and LeCun, who got it the year after uh, Hennessy and I got it, and recognizing the, the contribution. So what we see as advances in AI is really advances in deep neural networking starting to work. So why is it starting to work? The, these aren't new algorithms that they invented. The algorithms have been around about 20 years. What's happened is that we needed a lot more data and a lot faster machines than when those algorithms were invented. It's easy to get more data today from the cloud and Internet of Things devices. But what about faster machines? Sadly, just as we need much faster machines, Moore's law is letting us down because Moore's law is getting to slow down. And as you can see in the graph below, this is Moore's law prediction of doubling every two years and versus microprocessors that came from Intel. In terms of the transistors per chip, we're off at least a factor of 15 where we would be if Moore's law still held. And that lack of transistors per chip turns into performance, as you can see the graph on the right. In the 1980s and 90s, when Moore's law was alive and well, we were turning those transistors into faster computers, so doubling performance about every 18 months. At the time, people would throw away perfectly good working computers because they were two years old and much slower than your friend's computer. These days, nobody gets rid of a good computer. If my laptop, I throw it away only if the battery breaks or the display breaks or something like that, because the performance is about the same. And indeed, in benchmark measurements, it's only per improving a few percent per year. So instead of doubling performance every 18 months, we double performance every 20 years. So we need faster machines. How are we going to do that without the help of Moore's law? Computer architects think the only way we can do this is domain-specific architectures, DSAs. They don't try to do everything, but just do a few things exceptionally well. What this means for computer architects is five decades of experience of designing general purpose processors may not apply. So if you're a researcher, this is an exciting new times, new innovation, brand new ways to design computers. Oh boy. But however, if you're at a company trying to sell products, it's a very scary time because which thing should you build? And we need these domain specific architectures for both the cloud and the edge. So the cloud is simply warehouse scaled computers with 50,000 servers in them at remote storage, pla remote places. They also have storage in them and distributed to data centers around the world that are connected via the internet. That is the cloud. Warehouse computers all over the world. And the edge is the tiny computers that often battery powered the Internet of Things or cell phones or laptops, cars, tennis shoes, everywhere. So that's the cloud and the edge. Let's do them in sequence, starting with the cloud. Well, Google was one of the first people to get excited about both deep neural networks and then domain specific architectures. In 2013, they calculated that if 100 million users started doing deep neural networks, three minutes a day on CPUs, they would have to double the size of the data center. 
not only would that be very expensive, it would take forever to build twice as many data centers in the cloud. So they set an emergency project whose goal was to make a factor of 10 improvement over existing CPUs and DPUs. And they gave them very little time because uh, this could happen any day that people would want to start using deep neural networks. So that it was done in just 15 months from ideas to working hardware and software. And they exceeded the expectations remarkably enough in that short time. It was about a factor of 80 times better than the contemporary general purpose CPUs and about 30 times faster than the NVIDIA uh, GPUs. And putting this in perspective, these are amazing numbers because factors of 10 in commercial products are rare. You can sell a lot of products if you're only a factor of two better. This is factors of 10 to 80. Why? Why was it successful? First of all, it, an amazing number of arithmetic units. It has 256 by 256 arithmetic units, 64,000 multiply accumulators. Secondly, that they were doing work on 8-bit integer data rather than 32-bit floating data, so it can be more energy efficient and take less memory capacity and be faster. And because it was domain specific, it dropped a lot of the general purpose features that dominate CPUs and GPUs, like caches and branch predictors. This saves area and energy and lets the transistors get reused for domain specific hardware. Okay, TPU V1 was success. TPU V1 was for inference, which is the simpler task. So for TPU, TPU V2, they wanted to take on training. So it's a bigger task because it's more computation, it needs more memory, and the data has to be bigger than the integers. And so, and then trying to figure out what were the good ideas that we should carry over and what had to be new. Well, first thing was, I said, it takes longer to train. It could take on pr Google's production applications, on, if we were trying to do it with one chip, it could take more than a year. So that's obviously, no one's gonna wait more than a year to get uh, their results back. So, uh, when you think about the bigger machines and more data lead to bigger breakthroughs in machine learning, that was true in 2015, just like it is today. The goal was to build a supercomputer for deep neural networks. And in retrospect, that was a great decision. Here's a result from our colleagues at OpenAA, just showing the thirst for machine learning training. So if you wanted to state the state of the art they calculated going back to 2012 up through 2019, the appetite is 10x per year. Whereas uh, Moore's law, which you know when it was at full speed was 10x every five years. So dr dramatically faster appetite uh, for training at the very state of the art. A critical feature for a supercomputer is how the chips talk to each other. Google decided to build inside every chip what we call ICI or inner core interconnect. Each, each link in each direction has 500 gigabits per second, and there's four of them per chip, so that's pretty phenomenal. But it's not very expensive. It uses only an eighth of the die to do the distributed switch and the interconnect. Um, and the TPU v2 supercomputer scales up to 256 TPU v2 chips. So compared to the classic data center network, the links are faster, it's cheaper because there's no it network interface card or, and there's no switches in it. So it's cheaper, faster, and there's not, those don't form bottlenecks. Uh, and so that maybe it's five times faster at one tenth the cost. So this was a, a big feature for our domain specific architecture. Then the question is resigning chip, how many cores per chip? For TPU V1, we had one core per chip, but you know, GPUs can have a hundred cores per chip. So where should we go? Well, the challenge is with, as the feature size gets smaller with more advanced semiconductor technology, the global wires that go across the chip don't scale anywhere. So the delay increases. So that's an argument for not making too big a, a, a core chip. Now we know that training can lose lots of processors, so it's acceptably it's more cores. So where we went to advice is Seymour Cray, the, um, the greatest supercomputer architect of all time. And when he was asked the way he said how many cores, he said, if you're plowing a field, what would you rather use? Two strong oxen or 1,024 chickens? So we went with two strong oxen. So 
the TPV2 has two cores per chip uh, to prevent the longer, uh, so it wouldn't have a slower clock cycle. And we thought it wouldn't be much easier to do two beakier cores per chip rather than, you know, 1,024 Wimpy cores. What about the supercomputer arithmetic? The TPV1 success was this 256 by 256 8-bit integer multiply and accumulate. If we did that for 32-bit floating point, that would just be too big, too much area and too much energy to do that on a single chip. And 16-bit floating point is much faster. Typically, it would be eight times faster uh, because the mantissa that you multiply is much smaller. So we experimented with doing floating point using 16-bit floating point. Now, if you can see in the format below, the sta IEEE standard, which was developed by Berkeley and led to my colleague, Belville Khan, winning the Turing Award, 16-bit IEEE flame point has only five bits of exponent. So that is a very narrow range. You need to represent really small numbers when you're dealing with training on CPUs and five bits of exponent doesn't support that small number. So what they found was if they tried to do an IEEE floating point, uh, they ran into problems. So, but if they kept the exponent the same as the full precision, which is eight bits, they didn't. But they didn't need very many bits of transition. So this brain float format has the same exponent, eight bits, as single precision, but only seven bits instead of 23 bits, single precision, and that worked just fine. So this is a great result because it's faster, it's less die area, uh, because the multiplier dominates, the multiplier at seven bits is half of the die area of a, a 10 bit multiplier. And uh, it's also half the energy. So it's, it works better for software, less hardware, less energy. So brain float is a much better black match to machine learning training. And in fact, as a result, everyone else has embraced it. ARM, in, Intel, and many startups have decided to include uh, brain float for uh, machine learning. This is the floor plan of what the chip looks like. The, the dividing line in the middle is, shows the two cores, uh, upper core and the lower core. Uh, the matrix multiply units, only 10% of the chip, uh, you know, interestingly. And as I said, the, the ICI links there in purple are just about 12% uh, of the chip. Google uh, did a second uh, implementation of the same technology after doing it, they thought that it, with a little bit more work they could do another one that would be even better. So the TPU V3 has about one third faster clock, the ICI interconnect link bandwidth is about a third faster, and the memory bandwidth is about a third faster. The big change is they decided they can do two of these multiply units per core rather than one per core as in TPV1. So one third faster clock and twice as many cores, it's about 2.7 times peak performance. Now to go that much faster, they burned a lot more power. And so it went from an air-cooled design that, I, that was on the prior slide. And so in the middle of the slide, you see these gray pipes connecting the, the four TPUs together. And those pipes contain liquid that cools the chips. Um, it has more memory, uh, twice as much memory as TPU V2. And we can scale up to a much bigger supercomputer it goes up to 1,024 chips. The die size grew only a little bit. It was in the same technology despite these uh, enhancements because basically uh, the Google designers had a better idea of how to do the layout the second time around. Before we talk about scaling, let's talk about individual chip performance. Well, we need to do benchmarks. Now for TPU V1, we use production applications to uh, evaluate that, but that's Google, that works for Google, but no one else could use those Google's production applications because we keep them secrets. <laughs> and so we helped create um, benchmarks that the whole industry use called MLPerf. We, with some other organizations, got it on the ground floor. So we've got two sets of evaluations of how the speed up of the TPU V3 is over the contemporary GPU, which was the Volta. So using the ML Perf benchmarks where Google works hard to get them running and Nvidia works hard to get them running, it was about a tie. It's about the same speed. The geometric mean is one. Now, if we look at Google production applications, it's completely different. The TPU is five times faster. So how could that be? Well, well 
well, what the problem was when we talked about that brain floating point format, it, the B float, which is in TPUs, was easy for Google application developers to use, but they couldn't and, and didn't want to get IEEE FP16 to work because that takes extra work to get the same results. And you have to change the software to do that. So we didn't do that. So we thought, uh, so that was our experience, but we're not the only one who does that. Uh, the, the Vector Institute also is uh, at, in Toronto, only one of the 200 people use the 16-bit floating point when they use GPUs. Everybody else uses 30 points. So we'd have probably get that same factors of five results different there. Okay, let's talk about scale up. Remarkably, uh, AlphaZero, this is the program that beat all human beings of the world at both chess and Go and one other game. It is almost perfectly scaled up. So with 1,024 TPU v3 chips, it goes 980 times faster, which is 96% of perfect speed up. And three other applications run at 99%. So it's just almost perfect speed, uh, scale up. It's just what you want from a supercomputer. How can we compare this domain-specific supercomputer to conventional supercomputers? Well, it's not going to be apples and oranges, but the, there's some similarities. So we're going to use the Alpha Zero program, that one that beats everybody at chess. This is the production program uh, in Go. And using it real data. And it's using brain float 16 and IEEE 32-bit float. That's what its calculations. For supercomputers, the most common benchmark is link pack. This is a benchmark that isn't fantastic. You can scale up to any size in Limpact to keep all the processors busy. This is called weak scaling and it's synthetic data. It's not real data that is created. So the more chips you have, uh, the more data you get. The other difference, they're not running the same benchmark and also this is doing 32-bit and 64-bit floating point instead of 16 and 32. And, and so the results are at the bottom. So um, remarkably, running a production application, Alpha Zero gets 70% of peaks. That's 70% of 1,024 chips times the peak performance per chip, which is amazing. But you can see for Linpac, uh, the two supercomputers we have here get about 60%. In terms of the actual petaflops per second, it's almost 90 for TPUv3 versus 60 and one. The reason this slower computer there in yellow is there is because there's another way you can look at the Limpact results. It's called the green 500, which plots, resorts the top 500 list by flops per watt. And the green 500 winner is the Saturn V there at 15 watts. But TPU V3 is 10 times better performance per watt than the number one green supercomputer, which is pretty remarkable. Okay, that's a tour of using domain-specific architectures for the cloud, what about the edge? So here's two examples. Uh, the first one is from Alibaba, the, the called the Jean T910, and then a startup company also using RISC-V like the Jean T910, but it's a very inexpensive computer intended for Internet of Things devices. So what is this RISC-V stuff? So if you remember from uh, your computer architecture course is that when software talks to hardware, it has to talk in a vocabulary. And we call that vocabulary an instruction set or an instruction set architecture. So up until recently, all instruction sets have been proprietary. To speak to a computer, you have to get a license from somebody. The two most popular ones are owned by Intel and by ARM. So a decade ago, uh, Berkeley asked the question, why do instruction sets have to be proprietary? Couldn't we allow an open architecture and open source IP? Uh, and we call that project RISC-V for RISC-V. And it's called RISC-V because in the 1980s, I worked on four RISC projects. All right, and so what is different about RISC-V? As, as we said right at the beginning, it's free and open. That means anyone can use it, uh, which is gonna lead to more competition and more innovation, I think. From a startup company's perspective, the benefit is you can pick the ISA first and then pick the vendor later. So that's a big benefit for them. Otherwise, you have to, if you're a startup company, you have to sign a contract 
and it can take three or six months to negotiate a contract because you want to be careful about how much you pay for that because there's usually a royalty that's associated with one of those IP licenses. It's for both the cloud and the edge, both 32-bit computers and 16-bit computers. It's designed to be easy to enhance. And this is important for domain-specific accelerations to be able to add instructions to tailor it to the applications like artificial intelligence. Basically, you just need room to evolve the design when you do that, and we knew that was going to be important in the future, so we left room for evolution. Another thing that's different is that it's modular in that there is a base core instruction set that has about 40 instructions that runs the whole software stack. And then if you want to, you can add these optional extensions. This is very different from all previous instruction sets, which require you to include any new enhancements have to be included there forever in the future. So it's kind of like as you get older, your body typically gets bigger, gaining weight over the years. That's what happens to instruction sets too. For RISC V, there's optional extensions that you can use or leave out, but you can go away with just the skinny 40 instructions and that works fine. That core is simple and elegant. It's very similar to the first RISC processor that we did in Berkeley, far simpler than the ARM x86, which their instruction set vocabularies are dictionaries that could be several inches wide. <laughs> Uh, with thousands of instructions. It's instead of owned by a company, it's owned by the community. Uh, there's a foundation called Risk International that owns the instruction set. And so it can keep going no matter what happens to the, an individual company. Uh, Risk 5 can ev keep evolving it as long as people are excited about it. Another issue that came up is security and trustworthy in this modern world. Basically, because it's an open architecture, you can design the core for yourself so you don't have to get it from Intel or from ARM. And then there's, it enables open implementation so you can see what's inside it, just like the same benefits for, say, like Linux. You can see what's inside Linux and it helps you feel more secure about what's in there. RISC-V International uh, is incorporated in Switzerland and there's, I'm surely, more than 600 members today in, in 50 countries all over the world. So my vision for this RISC V is uh, is that it'll be everywhere, you know, in Internet of Things devices all the way up to supercomputers. But there's a secondary vision is that by having open source that we can collaborate across the world, our thoroughly globalizing computing industry, we might be able to release tensions. If you're working with people all over the world in open source hardware and open source software, maybe that'll make it easier for us to have collaborate across the world and reduce some of the tensions that have come up. Speaking of cooperating all over the world, let me tell you about the RIOS Lab, which stands for the RISC-V International Open Source Laboratory. So our mission is to make the RISC-V ecosystem world-class. It's a nonprofit organization. We're going to judge success by a number of people using our ideas. Everything is going to be open source. The goal is to produce industrial strength, intellectual property, that explicitly tries to avoid patent lawsuits. Lots of people are designing processors. There's 25 or so processors uh, available now. We're gonna try and work on what's called the Uncore, the other parts of the chip that are necessary, but aren't as popular to design. The Shenzhen municipality gives the base funding and we're getting matching funding from companies, both in Shenzhen and all over the world, as well as uh, money, we're getting uh, help from them in terms of engineers to work on these open source projects. This distributed lab uh, will have the majority of the engineers at TBSI, that stands for the Tsinghua University and UC Berkeley joint venture that has been in Shenzhen for six years. This is going to, lab is going to be on this campus. And we'll also teach about RISC V. And, you know, uh, like other graduate programs, try and create future leaders of technology. I'm the director. My former student, Zhang Ji Tan, is an adjunct professor and co-director, and another Berkeley alumnus, Professor Lin Zhang, is a co-director, and they'll be running the lab there in Shenzhen. Uh, machine learning needs faster machines to advance artificial intelligence, and the, this is being done with machine learning and deep neural networks. With Moore's law slowing down, the only way we're gonna do this is domain-specific architectures. Google's TPUv1 demonstrated you get factors of 50 of performance per watt 
over general purpose computers, which is a very exciting result. And besides in the data center, we're gonna need these domain specific architectures on the edge as well. RISC-V is a boon to doing domain specific architectures because it gives you a standard instruction set that you can enhance, add your secret soft for your applications. The real slab at TBSI in Shenzhen is gonna develop open source IP that everyone can use to help you build these chips. And if you or organization are interested, you should contact us. Rios is actually Spanish for rivers, and we picked that name because rivers symbolize collecting resources from many lands to create this strong force that can change the landscape. And we hope the Rios lab at TBSI is gonna collect lots of resources from all over to create a strong force that will improve the technology landscape. Thank you very much.